Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Shiraj Jaitley from New York. Thank you for watching, learning and sharing on moneymeterhealth.com, your favorite website dedicated to teach on human heart and its illnesses. So I welcome you on moneymeterhealth.com, your favorite website, which is dedicated on two channels now, uh, which is Facebook and YouTube, both in English and in Hindi. As much as possible, we like to uh, keep it short and simple, and yet at the same time, want to give you the best information possible in the in the few minutes that we normally have on, uh, each on the uh, each of these uh, video vignettes. Uh, without any further ado, as always, uh, I delve into the matter and the subject of the matter today being post-operative course in a post-cabbage setting. So, which is uh, post-op in cabbage patients, if you will. So we'll be talking about that very briefly. I like to say that obviously cabbage patients are high risk patients because they are obviously going for a coronary bypass and therefore they do have other morbidities which are normally accompanying most of the patients who have atherosclerosis of the coronaries. Like they could be hypertensives, they could be diabetics, they could have uh, issues with uh, um, smoking, they may be having a COPD, they may have renal problems and or heart failure. They may have other issues like uh, immune problems, uh, systemic illnesses, and of course, age is a big uh, factor as well. And smoking is certainly is a high risk factor because that comes in along with brings in peripheral vascular disease and uh, uh, atherosclerosis of other vascular disease as well. So, without any further ado, let's let's delve into what are the post-operative uh, uh, complications or morbidities, if you will. Uh, that normally one can face in an ICU, uh, surgical ICU setting as the patient is coming off the pump and now is being transferred into the ICU settings. That's where the cardiologists like us who are involved, they could be uh, facing these problems. So without any further ado, I like to divide them into various groups. The first group being cardiovascular, obviously. So I like to see how best uh, we can uh, understand the cardiovascular issues. Now, normally the Normally, the commonest man manifestation that one really uh, runs into is low blood pressure, for instance. That could be hypotension and a low cardiac output also as assessed by a swan gans, which is already in place. So these are right heart catheters just for the sake of the students and fellows, and they're constantly checking the pressures, they're checking the cardiac output, they're checking the systemic vascular resistance, and of course, they're also checking your uh, uh, pulmonary capillary veg pressures, which define the entire parameters uh, in patients who have uh, cardiovascular problems. So if any of these, uh, like uh, as I said, if somebody, if you, if you run into problems with hypotension persistently or low cardiac output, then obviously one has to really get a bedside echo immediately as well in addition to getting the rest of the parameters. So when you get a bedside echo, it could be a transesophageal echo, uh, which is a T, or you can just get a transthoracic echo as well post-operatively, and then you try to immediately compare that with the previous ones, the pre-operative, uh, which you have already had uh, in your files. And when you look at the two, you can say what's going on with the LV ejection fractions. So things to look at are LV ejection fractions, and are they, is it normal or is it down? Uh, the second thing you want to see is are there any clots around the pericardium? So you want to see if there's any cardiac tamponade, in other words. If there are a lot of clots, then of course that has to be treated accordingly. So patients may require exploration back. Uh, they may have to go back to the OR for further exploration. And uh, the chances are if there is a cardiac tamponade that's present, uh, then at that point you may require to evacuate those uh, clots because otherwise drainage alone will not uh, suffice. Some people have uh, treated that conservatively by putting drains or leaving the drains for a few extra days post-operatively, but invariably if the clot is forming, then the clots will be tending to be localized specifically to the right atrial area where the cannulation has occurred. And uh, like if the patient is, uh, here's a diagram that I'm drawing just for the sake of our uh, uh, understanding. And then when you have, so this is the place where the cannulation is done. So in the right atrium, you can have a clot here sitting uh, near the pericardium. You may have clots in the anterior area here as well. But that's where the bypasses are all going. And as a result, or you could have clots around the left atrial pericardial area as well. So these are the common areas and therefore they could compromise and one can actually end up uh, using uh, a lot of these as uh, uh, the reasons why one gets uh, to 
um, uh, ch check that by transesophageal or transthoracic echoes. So having said that, now any, uh, the next other problem that commonly occurs that one has to see. So if the ejection fraction is low, you know it's, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of heart failure management and therefore one can use dobutamine and uh, dopamine, etc., to build up the pressures, improve the cardiac output, reduce the systemic vascular resistance in these individuals so there's an afterload reduction and you can actually help the ejection fraction get better. And over a period of time, things stabilizing patients could be weaned off those strips. Likewise, as I said, for cardiac tamponades, the patient will have to require full exploration again, and the patients will have to go back into the surgery. Uh, into the surgery. Uh, our next uh, issue would, that can arise is here is uh, uh, post-pericardio uh, post tummy syndrome. So basically what happens is here the post-pericardiotomy syndrome, we call it, and the PPS which normally manifests by uh, low-grade fever, ESR, bilateral chest x-ray infiltrates, sometimes pleural effusions, pericardial effusions, and patient has general malaise in the, within the first few days of post-operative uh, uh, period. So that is, a, that is, and of course, leukocytosis and ESR will give you the indication. So here the diagnosis is based on a chest x-ray, which will show the bilateral uh, infiltrates or uh, ARDS, for instance, that kind of a pa pattern may be present. You may have pleural effusions, of course, and these are the other manifestations that can occur. And then on an echo, you will see pericardial effusions will be present as well. Uh, so most of these patients, they respond very well to steroids. So one can start with 60 to 80 milligrams of, uh, depending upon the patient's body weight, of uh, 60 to 80 milligrams of prednisone. And so because uh, PPS is considered to be an anti-heart uh, antibody syndrome. So it's also called anti-heart antibody syndrome. And normally the antibodies are uh, triggered by either a traumatic uh, uh, pericarditis or it's uh, triggered by hemopericardium that can be uh, present or it can be also uh, present because of the denatured uh, myocardial proteins. So denatured of the, of the myocardial proteins will do that as well. So just so that you know, these are the common causes, uh, traumatic pericarditis, hemopericardium, and denatured myocardium uh, uh, proteins uh, will also result into anti-heart antibody syndrome, which is a longer name, but the PPS, which is uh, pedipericardiotomy, or post-pericardiotomy syndrome rather is more easier. <laughs> so having said that, so these are some of the cardiovascular manifestations. Let's go to the other manifestations, which could be anywhere from, um, uh, say, pulmonary. Now in pulmonary, one sees the following. Well, we've talked about the ARDS, which is a very common uh, um, entity that can, uh, that can be faced within the uh, surgical ICU. Patient has uh, trouble weaning off the ventilators. Normally, they require ventilation support for a longer time, uh, but invariably, they, they get better unless there's an infection present, but then you have to look up for any pneumonias. If there are pneumonias, then of course, you must treat for gram negative because that needs an adequate coverage. While the cultures from the sputum, from the bronchialveolar lavage are pending, sensitivities one starts to look at uh, gram negative and staph coverage obviously has to be done so um, cefazolin with uh, say uh, uh, aminoglycoside to combination is a wonderful drug here you could use for that so pneumonias uh, but the only the only thing to remember is uh, uh, out of the pneumonias the mortality is extremely high 30 to 40 percent at the at the end of uh, first 30 days so just remember that remind yourself that uh, pneumonias are have to be treated very, very cautiously because your mortality numbers can really go high in your surgical programs. So just be careful with those. Um, thirdly, one uh, comes across uh, problems related to SIRS, which is uh, uh, SIRS. It's a systemic immune uh, uh, response system that the body tends to be inflamed. The entire immune system is inflamed, if you will, and normally manifest with, again, low grade to medium grade fever and uh, chills. It just gives you the feeling of uh, malaise. Uh, Multi-organ failure, of course, can set in, so just be, just be mindful of that. Hypotension can occur, tachycardia may persist, etc., etc., etc. So SIRS is another issue that needs to be addressed and kept be cognizant of. Uh, the other issues are arrhythmias. I just don't wanna spend much time on arrhythmias because I think they have been covered in various other uh, videos, SVTs and AFs, 
AFs uh, tend to be very, very prevalent, up to 20% postoperatively. One sees uh, uh, the, the prevalence of uh, atrial fibrillation, and they should be managed with amiodron because that's, that's a great drug now, which can be started preoperatively, continued intraoperatively, and then continued postoperatively uh, until, until the patient is in sinus rhythm. So this could be followed as an outpatient with repeated holters on a monthly basis to ascertain if the patient is now slowly um, converting into paroxysmal AF or there's hardly any AF during the, during the several holters that you have done over the period of three to six months post-op. But normally, uh, amiodron can be tapered off after three months. But just, but just be sure that there are enough holters to say that this patient is, uh, is not in, uh, not showing any paroxysmal AFs and is in sinus for a longer time. So that should stabilize. SVTs, of course, they could be managed intra-op with esmolol and then uh, post-op um, as soon as the patient is uh, um, now able to take orally can be switched over to any beta blocker of your choice. Um, other, uh, other problems include renal functions, for instance. One has to look at uh, renal functions and those renal functions where patients can manifest as acute renal failure and uh, creatinine tends to go higher in these patients uh, postoperatively. Invariably, it's all because of uh, prolonged um, uh, cross-clamping uh, cross, uh, uh, time, and especially if the cross-clamping time is more than 90 minutes, that'll uh, lead you to uh, higher risk for acute renal failure. Sometimes these patients will go on dialysis, many times the diuretics and usual managements of uh, um, removing excess fluid will help, but uh, uh, dialysis may, may be required in the first few weeks uh, uh, within the uh, post-operative period and sometimes chronically also. Uh, it's also dependent on the other issue with uh, the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. At those times are also more than 90 minutes or 120 minutes that have been linked. Most U.S. studies have shown that 90 to 120 minutes cardiopulmonary bypass time will lead to have higher incidence of acute renal failure. Uh, another uh, interesting part that I'd like to make sure that, the, you know, you as a cardiologist are when you're making rounds of surgical ICU post-op. Uh, post-op bleeding is very, very important. So you have to be sure that uh, the patient has adequate coagulation factors uh, because coagulation factors can go down, especially if the patient is on, uh, is, uh, is on pump, conventional cabbage is done. But off pump uh, uh, bleeding, uh, the bleeding bleedings are not that uh, bleeding episodes are not that common, at least in the first uh, few weeks. Um, but uh, postoperatively, again later on, uh, they can occur. The other thing that one has to be very very cognizant about is neurological, and uh, neurological uh, dysfunctions commonly are either cognitive, um, which will be only in the first uh, couple of days uh, in the surgical ICU, where there is uh, impairment in speech, impairment in thinking, impairment in intellect impairment in memory, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing is a, a documented CVA. If that occurs like a stroke, then of course a brain MRI will help uh, diagnose, uh, and then you have to treat it conservatively uh, without any further anticoagulants and because you have to be they are very, very high risk. And unfortunately, CVAs tend to occur, especially if there's strong family history, if there's some smoking, there's hypertension and diabetes. If those coexist in risk factors like enumerated here in the top, then CVA is very, very common. Uh, last but not the least, of course, neuropsychiatric problems can occur and depression is very, very common. And patients who are depressed, normally they have some history of depression even in the uh, pre-operative stage. So these are some of the complications that I've listed here and other complications I just want to briefly mention about. And before we close for the on this video, our endocrinological, like for instance, you can have a sick uh, thyroid syndrome, you could have, you could develop diabetes insipidus. And then very rarely, of course, the worsening of diabetes mellitus itself. So the attempt is to keep the fasting sugars closer to 130 range in those endocrinological issues. And um, postoperative infection we just talked about because, of course, you have to address the sputum. You have to make sure you have uh, the wounds uh, in the sternum are healing well. And the, and the saphenous grafts in the legs, if they have been employed, they should be healing well. And last but not the least, in the neurological, I forgot to mention, one should also keep in mind that nerve injuries can occur, and specifically the median nerve, the radial nerve, and then the phrenic nerve. These are the three nerves that can be involved in these individuals, and medial and radial normally occur because of the fracture of the rib that can occur during the time the stenotomy 
uh, the sternum, uh, uh, the sternotomy occurs and the retraction of the ribs are occurring. So the first rib fracture uh, that can generate uh, median and radial nerve injury. Normally it recovers after, after a period of time. Phrenic nerve injury is normally when there is an internal thoracic artery that is being mobilized to uh, use that as a bypass here. So those things could uh, uh, be just be cognizant of the fact that they can't possibly occur. Again, once again, I thank you for uh, watching MoneyMeterHealth.com, your favorite website. This is your website, folks, to uh, quickly update you on the most uh, cutting technology of cardiology. Also, it's available for the general masses in English and Hindi. I'm sure they benefit even out of, the, out of these videos because it's so important that uh, familiarizing with some techniques and some um, issues and some terminology and some conditions that, that occur from time to time uh, in each of these uh, um, video vignettes that I present. Um, I'm sure they will find, find them interesting. Please, I welcome your suggestions, your comments and questions after, after you like my videos. So do, do comment and if you do like uh, my, my, uh, my discussion, make sure you press the like button at the end of the video presentation, please. Thank you for watching MoneyMeterHealth.com, your website. This is Dr. Jaitley. Until the next video, so long.